keeping. Please welcome Stephen. Good morning. Thank you. Hello, everyone. A very warm welcome to everyone here. I'm glad you're interested in these very interesting men and women right uh, behind me. They are not the Smurfs. Uh, they are UN peacekeepers uh, serving uh, all over the world and serving a very meaningful purpose um, and peace. And I also want to uh, thank the um, German Federal Foreign Office. Uh, we work very closely together with them. The, our center, the Center for International Peace Operations, normally goes by its German acronym CIF. And we were founded in the year 2002 uh, by the German parliament and uh, government. And we work to strengthen civilian capacities for peace operations. So our core mandate is to recruit and train civilian uh, personnel and provide analysis and advice on peacekeeping and peace building issues. And as mentioned, one of our closest partners is uh, the Foreign Office. And we are thankful for their support. Uh, without them, this would not be possible here. So what, is, what are peace operations, actually? Uh, what, what do we mean by this? Originally, it described unarmed military observers or lightly um, armed blue helmets like these people, um, just observing ceasefires and, uh, and peace agreements. But this has changed quite a bit in our very complex world of today. So um, they serve a latitude of, of tasks at the moment, and a lot of more players are involved at the moment. So it's not only the United Nations, it's also the African Union, it's the European uh, Union or the OCE. Uh, most of you will probably know the observers in, in eastern Ukraine, which is a very current example. So. UN peacekeeping or peace operations in general um, continue to serve in highly fragile political and security um, environments all over the world. And they are characterized by increasingly difficult circumstances and challenges. Uh, just two days ago, actually, there was um, another deadly attack on UN peacekeepers in uh, eastern Congo. Uh, two peacekeepers were killed and four are still missing. So this shows us how grave and severe the conditions can be. Uh, currently, over 120,000 military, police and civilian personnel serve in over 16 missions on four continents for the UN alone, and two-thirds of them in very uh, specific contexts with significant levels of ongoing violence. So why are we talking about innovation and, and peacekeeping? Uh, interestingly enough, the UN is reviewing its structures for peace and security at the moment, and they are also taking a very close look at how new technology, digital innovations, uh, but also other means can help them to fulfill their tasks. And there, there was a UN expert panel that just released a report. It's called Performance Peacekeeping. It's highly recommended. It's actually a very interesting read. It's a long report, but it shows a little bit what is already out there and what is used by innovative people like uh, those people sitting in the room and how the UN actually is trying to, to learn from them and, and use it for their purposes. So uh, our center supported actually uh, this panel also with a workshop and that's a little bit why we uh, had the idea of um, coming here and bringing together those different, um, those different fears. And I just want to, want to quote from, from the report of this uh, panel on technology and innovation. They said that no mission can be expected to succeed in today's complex environments without an ability to innovate and make more effective use of technology. And no advantage should be withheld from those working for the cause of peace. So I think that's a very uh, positive note. And uh, yeah, we just want to start off the discussion and um, I'm very glad that we will have a Skype input from colleagues from, from Congo, from uh, the mission there, it's called MONUSCO. It's an interesting mission because it's um, already there, it, it has been working in the Congo for 15 years, it's the biggest and largest mission we have at the moment for the UN, also the most expensive one. And interestingly enough, it's uh, the very first UN mission that acquired their own capabilities in terms of uh, unmanned aerial vehicles. And, uh, we will have two colleagues with us, uh, Daniel Meyer. He's one of our German experts. He's based in Goma. He's um, in charge of the strategic planning cell of, uh, of MONUSCO. And with him is Lieutenant Colonel Matthew White. Uh, he's an officer in the Royal Artillery of the British Army. And he's the chief of the unmanned aerial systems uh, in Congo. And he will tell us a little bit about how they are applying um, their UAVs uh, in Congo and how it helps their, their operations. 
But I also, I also want to welcome uh, three other colleagues uh, on the stage. We have Afrotis uh, Mutangana. He's a social entrepreneur um, from Rwanda. And he will later on tell us about a very interesting initiative that he has uh, founded and is um, yeah, working with crowdfunding uh, for, for a good purpose. Afrotis, welcome. We also have with us uh, Hakim George Hakim Hegeli. He's a freelance uh, journalist and a social media activist from South Sudan. And he will also give us some uh, insights from, from his country and uh, how the media and innovation uh, might play a positive role there. Hakim, welcome on stage. And last but not least, uh, I'm very glad that we managed to get Sanjana with us again. Sanjana uh, Hatotuva is actually a very good friend of TIFF and uh, probably one of the most knowledgeable people uh, when it comes to social media and peace building and peacekeeping issues. Um, he is actually, he wears multiple hats, uh, but among uh, many, he's a special advisor to the ICT for Peace Foundation, which is based in Geneva, Switzerland, uh, where he works to further the use of ICTs in crisis information management and peacekeeping initiatives at the United Nations. Sanjana, welcome on stage. So as mentioned, we will start off with the uh, input by our colleagues from, uh, from Goma in, uh, Eastern, in Eastern Congo. A warm welcome to uh, Daniel Meyer and Lieutenant Colonel Matthew White, please. <laughs> Talking about technology, I struggle a little bit getting the... Uh, I have to just... There we go. Okay. You can hear us, right? Yes, we can. Okay, excellent. We hear you also loud and clear. The stage is yours. Please. <laughs> if you just give your introduction, actually, I'm just realizing that we will have your uh, PowerPoint actually in parallel, so yeah, I have to do that, and you can, can just have a general introduction, and then we start with the presentation. Shall we start? Yeah. Are you good? We hear you. Yeah, schönen guten Morgen, Berlin. Uh, Chambo from Goma. <laughs> um, my name is Daniel Meyer. I work in the strategic planning cell of the UN Stabilization Mission in the DRC. Um, as you know, this mission has been uh, in place for the past 15 years. And uh, we have seen all kinds of, you know, innovations throughout um, the 15 years. And um, the latest one, I would say, is the unmanned aerial systems. And it reflects the uh, importance of the mandate evolution and also the uh, importance the uh, Security Council actually sees for new technologies in peacekeeping. Um, with every new capability and before you introduce it, you have to test it. So we are still basically testing. Uh, we are in a pilot phase of the UAS in the mission. And I just want to highlight why we believe that um, UAS is an important mission asset. It's basically um, increasing our situational awareness and we can monitor the humanitarian situation and movements on the ground in a country which uh, actually is characterized by a very difficult topography, um, bad road conditions, bad infrastructure, it is very hard uh, to move around. So having a S capability is actually increasing what we can see um, on the ground. It also helps us to monitor population movements and displacements. It helps us also to um, you know, um, support humanitarian operations. Um, it will also help us to increase, um, you know, our awareness of the um, movement of maybe armed groups, which is obviously one of the biggest uh, concerns that we still have tackling armed groups in Eastern DRC. And um, without um, further ado, I will hand over to Matt, who will actually get into the technical specifications and show you some samples of how UAS has been used for so far in MONUSCO. Matt, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Daniel. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I'm not a nerd in a blue helmet, but I did wear my blueberry especially for you. 
I was going to wear my helmet, but I forgot to bring it to work this morning. Um, but neither am I a nerd, frankly. Um, I am an operator and a, an operational commander of this system. So if you don't mind, I will now take my beret off. Uh, if we could go to slide number three, please, with the title Capabilities of the Celex Falco. Yeah. The Falco itself is a medium uh, UAS provided to us by a company called Celex. It has an operational ceiling of around 18,000 feet above mean sea level. Uh, which is very important here because we are at 4,000, approximately 4,000 feet here in Goma. And we also operate at the moment out of an airfield in Bunia at roughly the same altitude. So even if our aircraft are at 12,000 feet, we only have 4,000 feet between the airframe and the potential um, surveillance targets that we are looking at. The system is completely unarmed and it is important to emphasize that in the humanitarian space. It creates some difficulty with some agencies uh, because they believe that drones, a phrase that we are attempting to avoid because of the connotations around the world of such nomenclature, um, it is an unmanned air vehicle, the aircraft that actually flies, and the, the UAS is a system of individual parts, a ground control station, a ground data terminal, some auxiliary ground equipment, and so on. The Falco system can fly up to 10 hours, but we have limited it up to eight hours, and we ask our users to plan for around about five or six hours, and it can go out to a range of about 150 to 200 kilometers. The maximum is 200, but we ask them to plan around about 150. As Daniel has mentioned, the topography around here makes the line of sight communications very difficult at times. It has a, a mid-range MX-10 electro optical camera and an infrared camera and we are in the process of trying to devise standard operating procedures so we can deploy it quickly into rough grass airstrips but that is a, a technological leap in terms of the system design robustness that we are still um, examining. We do have the option here in MONUSCO for the synthetic aperture radar. Um, we will have delivery of that hopefully next month and we'll put that into effect. And we do have two remote viewing terminals, which are, in effect, hardened laptops that we can put out into the tactical scenarios headquarters with the users so that they can actually see the live feed from the airframe out on the ground. Next slide, please. The UAS mission process is initiated by the users. It is important to go and sell the idea and its utility to the various UN agencies as well as to the force. This is a mission asset, both on the civilian side and the military side. Once we receive all of the bids for the UAS, for one week we will coordinate who gets the assets against which tasks have priority. And as you follow the flow diagram down the slide, you can see that there is a pre-mission brief with the users. They fly the mission. There is dynamic image analysis some of the, the contract crew, as well as the UAS cell, has a, a major who is in the ground control station for every mission so that the, the system is utilized correctly into its full, and any reports that are required throughout the mission can be sent dynamically and quickly. After the mission is completed, there is a more detailed set of analysis, and the users get the products from the mission a post-mission report with captured images, uh, either still images or uh, real-time video. Next slide, please. The planning timelines at the moment, as they stand, if we have an emergency task, we can dynamically retask the airframe whilst it's in flight, if required. Um, so that is a priority one tasking. Priority two, if an emerging task um, comes to light, and the air force is on the ground, we can actually have that retasked and launched during the daytime within approximately one and a half to two hours, at night time in three hours. The routine priority tasks, priority three tasks, are what we would encourage the users to bid for from a routine perspective. If they give us three to five days notice, 
if we were able to include their particular tasking requests in the collections meeting I referred to earlier, and then we will allocate the airframes out. On average, we fly between five and six hours per mission, and there are two missions per, per day, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, uh, with one five-hour mission on a Friday, one five-hour mission on a Saturday. That means we have coverage on six days rather than just working week, Monday to Friday. In addition, we can, if the situation demands it, conduct continuous operations, therefore it's being pushed to the target area, continuous 72 hours. Unfortunately, thereafter, we have to have a recovery period because of uh, regulations on flying hours because of the pilots. They are a limitation in that particular scenario. But the staff that we have from Celex and the relationship we have with them mean that they are flexible, forward-leaning, and trying to make the most of the technology on behalf of Minusco at every opportunity. Next slide, please. As far as the concept of use is concerned, you can see on the slide illustrated the ground control station center at the bottom, which is connected to a power supply just to the left of it, providing uninterrupted power source. You've then got the ground data terminal on the right-hand side, which gives you line of sight communications out to the 200 kilometer range to the surveillance. The box on the left hand side just gives you a quick snapshot as what, uh, to what the internal operations of the ground control station look like with the pilot station on the left, the payload operator on the right with the image analyst and engineer sitting in the center. Now if you build the slide one time please, you'll see that if you deploy a relay aircraft to the second ground control station, you can then deploy another surveillance aircraft forwards out to an additional 30 kilometers to a maximum range of 230. Build the slide one more time, please. Turn the original aircraft once it has to turn to base because of uh, fuel limitations or a sensor malfunction or whatever the scenario. It is a very simple system. But as you can imagine, the technology to make that work is quite complex. And it can be occasionally fragile, affected by environmental conditions, as well as the topography, line of sight issues. Next slide, please. The possible tasking sets, really, um, I've just given a few examples here. This is by no means an extensive or exhaustive list. It is simply limited by the imagination potentially the user making the requests that are relevant to particular roles within the humanitarian space. It deals with both military taskings and civilian taskings also from the UN agencies. NGOs, uh, not UN NGOs, are able to be for uh, the UAS. Um, out here in Minusco, that is the situation we are uh, currently tending to uh, because there is some resistance based on the um, independence of those NGOs and their perception of the use of the technology. Next slide, please. What I would like to do now is just quickly show you some of the images that we collected here in the Democratic Republic of Congo. From a humanitarian perspective, you can see on the side a photograph of a village where the road has been washed out by some torrential rain and a, a landslide. This is obviously very important if there were military patrols going in that particular location and there was a security issue, or equally from the UN agency perspective, if they had to deliver aid and have a convoy going down that particular route or use it regularly, or indeed if they had people pass that route when the rainstorms, so they may be uh, trapped inside. Next slide, please. The normal activities slide just shows you how we can establish a normal pattern of life, either using the infrared sensor camera or the electro optical camera on board the Falco. It gives us very good clarity, albeit there is an MX50 camera greater uh, definition, high definition. Um, but we can establish pattern of life, we can uh, distinguish buildings, people, vehicles, and so on. So, for the purposes of the first mission, it is, is more than adequate. Next slide, please. Uh, you can also see from a 
an uh, activity of armed, uh, potentially illegal armed groups and illegal activity, uh, some fires burning in a jungle area, which is most unusual. It's not like a village scenario, and therefore it raised suspicion of the uh, payload operators. It transpired that this was a site where um, an armed group or an illegal gang were making charcoal, and we spotted it uh, using the red cameras with uh, white showing the hot spots on the camera. Next slide, please. By following the line of people uh, back those sites where the charcoal was being made, we were able to discover where their camps were. Next slide, please. Zoom in to see some of the detail about how they were operating and descriptions of individuals on the camp. Next slide, please. Where the vehicles that were bringing the wood or taking the charcoal away were actually traveling, al traveling along, so you can identify there how many vehicles and therefore potentially queue other assets like the National Police or other agencies, UNPOLP or FBU, to go and deal with these individual convoys. Next slide, please. And indeed, there you can see the lorries coming up to a checkpoint here in the DRC. So again, it raises a number of issues, a number of questions we can then take to the various organisations and agencies here in order to make sure that uh, we bottom out what's going on. Next slide. One particular example, which we constantly quote, is the uh, use of the UAV when it was on a training flight and a testing flight here from Goma. Uh, they were made aware or spotted the fact that there was a ferry that uh, started to sink on Lake Key to the south of here. You can see quite clearly in the centre of the picture, the boat semi-submerged all the past water. The UAS stopped what it was doing, stayed on the station, kept eyes on to this particular incident and then queued in the Uruguayan Riverine Patrol to save 50... I did perish. Colonel, I think uh, we, we, we lost the signal. Can you hear us? Oh, that's too bad. Just uh, there we are. <laughs> uh, okay, can you hear us again? Brilliant, thank you. Are you on the final slide, please? Key takeaways? Yes. <laughs> thank you. Uh, uh, just to warm everybody up, this is my last slide. Um, it is a mission asset. It is a uh, military and civilian asset to be used here in the MONUSCO mission. It is highly flexible, multi-purpose, day and night, which is a false multiplier, both from a situational awareness perspective, which is extremely important, be it from a military perspective or a civilian perspective. Um, it is not yet appreciated, I don't think, at each of the levels and within all the, each of the organisations what a powerful tool this is, in terms of bringing them information about how they can then plan and execute their various operations. Um, and the tasks are really limited only by the imagination of the task requester. Um, finally, it does have a huge amount of untapped potential um, and it will, I believe, have a significant role in the future of UN operations. And that concludes my presentation and with Daniel, thank you very much. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Thank you for your time. Thank you for this very interesting insights into your operations. And uh, I think now we are moving a little bit uh, from, from the air uh, above us to more to the ground. I would like to hand over to, to Aphrodis, who actually is from, uh, from Rwanda, as I have mentioned. And Rwanda, as you know, is, uh, yeah, was the stage of one of the darker chapters of UN peacekeeping history. Um, and there are still people that, that are suffering from the genocide that took place. But uh, Aphrodis will actually show us how he is trying to help to, to uh, ease some of the pain that, that was done. So I'll just send over to him, put up his presentation. Uh, and voila. Yours. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Aphrodis Mutangana. I'm from Kigali, Rwanda, uh, in a space called K-Lab. It's an innovation space uh, for young entrepreneurs and fresh graduates. 
Um, I'm going to present you an initiative we started called Inchik Initiative. Uh, as you know, in Rwanda we had a genocide where one, more than one million uh, die, uh, were killed in 100 days. And um, we have survivors of genocide. So in Chike, let me explain first the word in Chike. In Chike is lonely in a negative way. It means uh, in Chike are survivors of genocide who are more than 70 years and uh, who survived uh, alone. Uh, before I start, let me share with you um, this 51 seconds video and... Uh, Thank you. Um, I want to share with you uh, this story. When I, how did I come with this idea? Uh, it's after visiting this mom. She's called Karita Siniragakara. She's 85. She had nine children before 94 genocide. Eight of them were killed during, during the genocide. And the surviving one was raped and contracted HIV. In 2000, she passed away. Now this, this old mom, you know, she cannot walk. And you know, in Rwanda, 75% are under 35 years old. Mobile penetration is, you know, 70%. Out of 11 million, 7 million people possess mobile phone. Then I said, as a young person, what can I do so that I can help these people? Because at that time, I learned that there were 859 in the whole country. I said, let me create a simple, a simple, the simplest technology. Uh, we decided to create a, a, a mobile crowdfunding. How it works, it's simple. You just take your phone, uh, you dial star 654 hash, and the app asks you to choose the language. We have three languages in Rwanda. One is Kenya Rwanda, two English, three French. After choosing, I ask you to subscribe because it's a 100 days initiative. Um, I ask you the amount to donate. The minimum is uh, eight, uh, seven cents US dollars and the maximum is 11 cents. And last year we had objective of, uh, you know, providing a cup of milk to these elder survivors of genocide. But this year we decided to dream big and, uh, you know, build for them houses. And, uh, as a young people, we had something in our, in, our, in, in our minds. Because it's something we are doing to give back to the community, we said, let's do something for some people who we, know, who we never know us and who we never repay us. So uh, the reason why you know, we had this quote, you have not lived today until you have done something for someone who can never, never repay you. And uh, we said, you know, we can make them smile. Uh, thank you uh, very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much, uh, Aphrodis. Uh, very interesting initiative, uh, very good. And I think it shows a little bit also the potential uh, of, of mobile penetration in Africa, which is among the highest in the world. And I would like to hand over to Hakim. Uh, as mentioned, he's a journalist, but also a social media activist, and he can give us some insights from uh, South Sudan, which is actually also, uh, at the moment, um, a country where we have a UN peace operation. Okay. Uh, thanks. Uh, as the whole talk is about uh, the nurse with, uh, with the blue helmet, I just want to say that uh, the presentation with the slides from Congo what uh, the guys just did here. It is something in South Sudan, uh, like it is not there. 
which I think is maybe for a certain reason, maybe after some time, because I know that the crisis in South Sudan is a continued uh, crisis after some initiatives or after, after some push, they might start thinking of that. The very simple thing that uh, you, uh, like the, the peacekeeping mission in, uh, in South Sudan is like also having sometimes is that uh, which I think can even like that is something if they if it is there can help more because we have like many of these remote areas where even I think you and they only know it through the maps or through whatever but they never been to the places and there's no excuse of uh, anybody saying that okay there's the, the communication infrastructure in these areas or not because South Sudan is also uh, with all this crisis, I think uh, uh, communication is good. We have like five uh, telecom com uh, companies in the country. And what happened, like many times, UN would know about any atrocities happen in a certain area in the country after like one month. And imagine after one month, you're knowing about 100 or 80, 80 people killed in a certain area and then you are going to collect the, the dead bodies doing what with it. So I'm always having uh, like issues in between the UN or between the peacekeeping uh, uh, mission in the country as well as with the government. But also if I'm going to take it from the side of the UN, uh, UN was there actually to like for peacekeeping. So they should find the ways of keeping peace, not, all, not only being in the country, but like even like come up with initiatives, like having uh, mobile uh, apps that uh, citizens in those areas can alert the UN of any potential attack or if anything happened that UN can really rush and like uh, uh, figure out what to do with it. But these things are not there. And always I know that UN in South Sudan it is a very unique situation whereby it become like a playground where it is a, a play for a place for fight or issues between UN uh, between the mission and the government and then the people are the the victims of these uh, these issues between UN and and uh, and the government. But I think UN also has a big role to play and to play by taking side with the people much of the time because it is. The people who are dying, it is not the UN. So there is a lot, but uh, I think this is some uh, some things missing here, uh, which is which, which I think I can touch from hundreds of them, and all the technologies they have they have in Congo now. I hope after some time they can start like thinking seriously by doing researches and and go to see all the conditions of the people around all these areas and come up with something better than. Uh, what we are having here. And it is really, really bad that you went to know that people were killed somewhere after two months. Sometimes we used to go with them to go to these areas. And yeah, they don't feel shy to go there and, ah, and collect stuff. And then they want to do press uh, conference after two, uh, two years, uh, after two months. What are you doing press conference for? What are you announcing? Okay, people were killed and then we just know now uh, and yeah, this is the numbers and this is the figures and this is some causes of the problem. This is, that is not your mission to collect bodies. Your mission is to prevent that, to, to, to like prevent anything that is going to affect the citizens in, the, in those areas. So I think there must be uh, some good plans for technology to, to, to be used on the peacekeeping mission. It is not only things between the government and then government give you permissions to go and rescue people. Because the government, they're like, they're, they don't do that, but they, all, they already have issues. Yeah, I think, so. I think that's a very good point. And uh, most people actually will subscribe to the notion that technology will not actually um, supplant the need for human presence on the ground. It's only one tool, but it can enable peacekeepers to do their job better, to be better informed, to gain situational awareness, as the colonel has mentioned uh, in the case of Eastern DRC. And uh, 
yeah, as mentioned, it's only one tool, but it's definitely not a substitute for, for the presence. Uh, Sanjana, I would like to hand over to you. Uh, I think you will tell us a little bit about the central challenges that we are facing and how the UN might uh, make use of all this new technology coming up and uh, the data that is available. Um, please enlighten us a little bit about Well, that. as I think the first two speakers and indeed uh, the mission from MONUSCO suggested, there is variance in the adoption, adaptation and availability of technology in various countries even just when the UN is present. So I think that's one challenge. But I have a couple of points that I'd like to make in the time that I have. Maybe looking at a more macro perspective and a more future-oriented perspective as opposed to a country issue or context-specific uh, um, uh, take. And uh, as you mentioned, the performance peacekeeping report by DFS, DPKO is a very interesting one. It's very big. The UN does not know pathologically how to make short, small reports. So it's about that big. Um, but having said that, it's also very interesting. Um, for what it has included in it. And I think to extrapolate from that, there are a couple of points that I'd like to flag in particular. One is that the age we're living in, it's not just in Berlin, but wherever there is technology today, there is this problem of radical inclusion. And the term is a spin-off on Assange's radical transparency. Today, for a peacekeeping or peace-building uh, enterprise, uh, the real challenge is how to deal with the multiplicity of voices on the ground because the democratization of technology has happened to such a degree that potentially everybody, every stakeholder, irrespective of where they are, who they are, what age they are, what gender, class, caste, or economic segment, has a potential voice. And it is the politics, the optics, the metrics, the architecture of inclusion, as well as exclusion, that I think is going to be far more challenging when we move on into the future. Ironically, the evolution of technology is going to both make this, in a sense, more challenging, but also open more potential and possibilities as well. So that's a discussion that I think we need to have. Alongside that, I think all of us, some of you are looking at the screens and not looking at us, and that seems to be a feature of these kinds of conferences, simply because we would call this social witnessing. You are, at the same time, peripherally cognizant of what is being spoken and happening around you, but your attention is almost focused on that nine, five, four, three-inch or tablet in front of you. And we are all witnesses to what happens around us, so it's not as if the journalists are the first ones to tell us, it's not as if the UN is the arbiter, are the arbiters of truth anymore. So social witnessing, wherever we are, is an interesting phenomenon. And the ITU, I think, says in our lifetimes, everybody is probably going to have some kind of mobile device. Never in human history has the Earth's population being addressable individually by a unique identifiable number. Uh, and we don't even know what implications this might have, but certainly for peacekeeping and peace building, it does raise some interesting questions around um, how society when everybody is a potential witness, impacts and influences peacekeeping and peace building. Uh, undergirding that, the foundation of that, I think, is something that is a bit of a white elephant in this room, also because we have funders and uh, supporters of this kind of event uh, from the likes of Google and Microsoft and big corporate agencies like Facebook, for example. Now, the benevolence of these companies is often taken as a given. However, the privatization of our individual information in corporate America is a concern. The information that the UN needs to make actionable intelligence out of currently and increasingly is resident in corporate domains and is hostage to the benevolence of corporate America. Now, when it is all well and good, it's a good thing. And there are a number of examples that I think can be quoted, and these companies often quote as to how they're helping peace building and peacekeeping and humanitarian domains, but it is a concern because our information is monetized primarily and is only secondarily, if at all, available for more charitable, civil society, peacekeeping and peace building causes and efforts. Now, that is a question I'd like to place for your consideration. Uh, there is also this talk of big data. Now, in your country, I know big data is probably a bit of a misnomer, but big data can be taken in very different ways, and there's no one single definition of it. But if we take it as a given that there is more data produced today than ever before, what the F does that mean, really? Does that mean that all of us, particularly in our part of the world, are empowered to a greater degree than we were in the past? Are the producers, the primary owners of this information, 
in any degree, shape, or form, better able to govern, to architect, to vision, and to hope for a better life as a consequence of big data? Or is it the case that it is also a power asymmetry, that the purveyors, the analytics of big data, the people who can crunch the data, the people who ask for the data, and the people who own the data are still very much reflective of the power asymmetry within uh, communities, within a country, and certainly in the international uh, arena. So these are questions that I think we need to ask around the, the oft-quoted potential of big data to influence peacekeeping, which I think is a given, but there's a darker side to it as well. And finally, in terms of disruptive technologies, and we have seen, for example, UAVs, and I think it's an interesting debate currently that's one of the hottest debates right now around how peacekeeping and peace building can wrest away the understanding of UAVs uh, uh, as, uh, in, as a conflation with uh, the offensive capabilities of the drones and predators, for example, used by the military. So that's an interesting uh, debate that's currently ongoing. But I wonder, for example, just by the mere introduction of UAVs, whether that's also a good thing. For example, who owns that imagery? Do the communities who have been reproduced or framed by this imagery have any kind of say in the decisions that are then made as a consequence of that imagery being available. You saw, for example, I don't know whether you saw it, but there were several slides there that said classified. Now, what that means is that within the same mission, force which owns that data does not, as default, share that information with an integrated mission and other actors in that mission. So Monusk itself has an asymmetry of intelligence. Force cannot and does not share what it knows to other parts of the mission. Now, do we talk about this? Or do we take it as a given that saving lives on Lake Kivu is by extension a justification for the promotion, adaptation, and adoption of this technology at a greater scale? And I think that these are questions that need to be asked because the UN itself is not asking them. And we ask them not to derail the process, but we ask it such that the process itself is strengthened. And from a rights and ethical perspective, our perspectives as the custodians of that information, as local communities, is also protected. So for example, you have questions around informed consent. What does it mean to be a citizen in the DRC or in South Sudan and have these things flying on top of us where there might be an expectation of help and support, but it not, may not be there. I'll end by saying that currently, the tragic earthquake that hit Nepal about a week ago brings to the forefront some of the real concerns and challenges around UAV operations in humanitarian efforts. Uh, there is absolute chaos on the ground. And it is not entirely clear why, but some news media reports also suggest that the government of Nepal has banned UAV flights simply because there is a chaotic, motley array of actors on the ground doing things not in harmony and collaboration and coordination, and the government is slightly worried. So these are, these are new challenges, these are new concerns, but as we move into the future, I think technology is a given, but I think as Navi Pillay, the former uh, High Commissioner for Human Rights in her opening address in March last year to the panel, uh, the session on human rights in Geneva said, uh, drones, UAVs, and social media, and the internet, these are new things to the domain of human rights. And our concern, at least my concern, and I'm sure it's shared in, amongst this room, is that there always needs to be an ethical, rights-based perspective to the technologies we champion, uh, otherwise the outcomes for the best of intentions may be very far removed from what we desire to see in a peaceful world. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sanjana, for this uh, very passionate uh, uh, talk and an insight. Let me just ask uh, one question. Interestingly enough, and I'm not sure whether the audience is aware of it, the UN is still lacking a comprehensive policy itself for the use of social media, and I think there is still it's on the way. Uh, and um, what is your what is your sense? Is is, is there really an, 
a very good debate going on? Are they are they knowing what the potential is, or what what kind of role do we as a community uh, or you as a community have to play? Is there is there a certain interface where the host communities can actually interact with the strategic debate in New York or where, wherever we have it? How does that work in, in practice? Well, there's a apocryphal story about the tweet uh, from uh, somebody in a camp in South Sudan, I think in Sudan, that went straight up to the head of WFP. This was several years ago. And that was a kind of a wake-up call for the UN that it's uh, uh, what it traditionally considered to be recipients or, or victims of a particular disaster were now people with agency. And it is now a given that the first responders to any disaster are not the UN, Uh, but the communities on the ground uh, themselves. So if you take, for example, Haiti earthquake uh, five years ago uh, and the Nepal earthquake a couple of weeks ago, uh, and if you take a look at sudden onset natural disasters, but also complex political emergencies uh, since in just the past five years, I think it is not fashionable anymore, to be very honest with you, to say that you are going to turn a blind eye to the plethora, the tsunami of social media uh, information out there. I think the challenge has moved from trying to convince the UN that this is important to now helping the UN to say, now what the hell do I do? Uh, even just out of, say, Aleppo or Syria, you have uh, a huge spectrum of unverified uh, voices at great velocity, in great volume, uh, coming almost every single day. So now the challenges are both on a machine algorithmic level, so you need supercomputing and great Uh, strides in computing power to deal with this information, but you also need uh, human analytical capabilities as well to understand. People make the mistake of always conflating information with intelligence, and it's not the same. Mm -hmm. You can be awash in information and completely devoid of intelligence that helps you to action something. So I think this is now the challenge for the UN. It is, there is variance across agencies and departments, but I think the UN has stepped up to this challenge, will step up to it, quite frankly, Stefan, not because uh, it might across the board be convinced of it, but I think that people have realized that if it doesn't do it, quite frankly and bluntly put, this is why I'll never be a diplomat, the UN <laughs> is going to be irrelevant. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, I just want to give uh, the other two uh, people on the panel a, a chance to, to react and maybe comment from, from their individual perspectives before we open up uh, to the audience for some questions, which I'm sure there might be some of them. Uh, Aphrodis, what, uh, what is your impression if you, if you see that? Is that something uh, that, that you can see in the future uh, having a, a, a greater role uh, for, for good or for worse? Yeah, uh, I'm seeing this in other aspects. Uh, what I want to say is about, you know, it is UN missions. You know, the UN missions is, the, their role is to protect the population. And uh, so when they are going to protect the population, uh, sometimes you, 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 you see that they are in, on, on the side of the government. So uh, I would like to share with you um, the one homegrown solution uh, what Rwanda mission in South Sudan and Central Africa are doing. We have something uh, called Umuganda, is the community work where every last Saturday, uh, we, as a community, we go together to clean the country or to, to do something for the society. And the U Rwandan um, uh, Defense Force, Uh, in Sudan and uh, uh, Central Africa, they started something, you know, to socialize, to socialize with the people. Where they go, and they have Umuganda together. Where the mission, they go with the population, and they work together so that they, the population can feel their presence. They ca then after that Umuganda, they can have a meeting with the population, and they can tell them, uh, you know, we are having this, you want to talk with you about this, you know, they are now open to the population according to, the, to this, you know, homegrown solution. Thank you. Thank you. Hakim, what's your impression? Uh, uh, okay, because uh, mine, uh, South Sudan, is very unique from Rwanda and from he, uh, him, because we are totally, like, uh, on the, the level of building things, not only building, uh, uh, like building the country, but there's uh, steps we're following in South Sudan. 
And with the, uh, with the mission in South Sudan, there's totally no any uh, uh, like links and uh, uh, things between the, the people that the mission is supposed to be there protecting and, and them themselves. Whereby in many cases it happened, which, or the biggest example is that recently when the 15th of December uh, crisis broke out in Juba, out of nowhere, people found like, okay, now people are being taken to the UN bases, not to the UN camps, whereby there was no camps actually in Juba to protect people or to, uh, like for, to host people in, the, in those camps. And then the, the bigger question was like, okay, when did these people like uh, uh, organize or arrange with, with UN that they are going to move to the bases and for UN to open and start like organizing uh, a shelters for them in, in, in their bases, which is not in their camps. That was before the, the whole thing started. So that one will always be a problem there because people know that UN doesn't have, uh, like there's no any interaction or there's no any like uh, mutual uh, debates with the, between UN and the, the authorities that brings the, that links the authorities plus the mission and the people in one place. So whenever there's something, both the government and the, 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 the citizens or the people are going to accuse UN or they are going to accuse the, the mission and the mission will have no any way of justification of whatever is happening because the only thing in South Sudan or the only thing in, uh, in Juba, for example, where the majority of the UN uh, bases are, is that people only see the UN vehicles passing, the UN vehicles coming and the helicopters and everything, but there's no like a good uh, relationship uh, between the UN and the people. The only initiative that happened or started happening uh, uh, last year, right after the, the crisis, actually, it was the Rwandan uh, battalions who started like building these bridges between the peacekeeping mission and uh, the community. Uh, and also they tried to like also link the, the Rwandan communities in, in, in Juba by building, they built one school actually in um, uh, like a rural, one of the, the biggest Ju, uh, Juba rural areas. And the, like the really thing, uh, the thing I really feel like it, it should be, that it should be how the peace uh, keeping should be is by them trying to link their people, okay, it is just they took it on the Rwandan side, not the, as a whole mission, by trying to build uh, ties between Rwandan people and uh, South Sudanese and trying to teach South Sudanese about uh, turmoil in, in Rwanda and like giving them examples of how they, they are trying to cope and trying to forget that era, trying to develop their countries and trying to uh, really live in peace. And people started like really believe in them and people like in South Sudan now, in Juba or in uh, the, the other areas, <laughs> The Rwandan battalions are like the, the, the soldiers people respect in South Sudan. Because of, because, of, yeah, yeah, because of certain things happen there and then uh, whenever the Rwandan battalions come, came, come into the rescue, they'll always be like respected by people. So... No, I think it's a very good, those, those are very good examples and I think that's actually a positive mm -hmm. note uh, that, that we can end on. I'm just uh, taking a look here at my colleague who's uh, showing the, the watch to me. Now I think it's good to see that, that there are really examples where the human presence on the ground really makes a difference and that we cannot do without uh, the interaction of the, of the troops uh, on the ground with the uh, local population and that there are certain ways of uh, enhancing this interaction by, by uh, new social media means, whatever. And I think it's also a very good uh, message that, that Sanjana told us that the UN is actually receiving those you know, signals and they are, they are worried about it, they, they are concerned about it, they grapple with that conceptually and are on their way to, to fuse that into their, their work. And I think um, there's, there's good uh, things to come in the future. And I think uh, it's for all of us to, to shape this debate also and uh, just point the fingers at the critical uh, moments, as Sanjana has said. Uh, privatization of data is a big issue. Uh, who owns the data and how do we use it? But uh, I think 
there's there's some some good potential, and um, I would invite everyone here to to shape the debate and then get involved. And if you really see some potential for if you're a developer and and say I have this idea, feel free to approach us or even the UN. Uh, maybe we can we can work something out and uh, come up with a tool um, that will help us to to make the world a better place. So thanks a lot for your uh, attention, and uh, I wish you a, a very good continuation of the day.